Are millennials killing canned tuna? This is the focus group. It's the savvy side of nine to five. Listen. Bueller. 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 Laugh. <laughs> And learn. Negotiation. This is what you do in business. This is The Focus Group with Tim Bennett. S-T-A-U-N-C-H. And John Nash. Keep your clothes looking neat and clean. We're all business. Except when we're not. Hello, hello. It's March 13th. Can you believe spring is charging ahead, John? You you, you set your clock ahead and... The sun is now brighter and all those things this week? Um, I've noticed the change in, in the amount of daylight we've had. And so when the clock change came, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. But, you know, back in the day, that happened a little later. They moved yeah. that They moved that up. Well, it's all a big farce anyway. So, hey, welcome <laughs> to the Focus Group. Tim Bennett here, as always, with my good friend and co-host, Mr. John T. Nash. The T is for trouble or talker or whatever you want it to be. Maybe Trek for Star Trek. I like that. That works for me. Be sure to follow along with us uh, on our live show, which is every Wednesday at 1 p.m. East, or uh, go to focusgroupradio.com and download any of our pre recorded shows and, of course, our podcast, which is TFG Unbuttoned, released every Tuesday morning, where John and I are sometimes a bit more political. <laughs> we don't want to be. We want to be entertaining. By well, the way, I'm, I'm glad you like this. is a new shirt. Well, I saw the shirt. Now, I don't know if people can tell what it is other than it looks like well, it's Well, it's got a pattern, and the pattern is little zebras on it. So it may come out as just like horsies or who knows what. Little, zebras? little zebras? Yeah. It was one of those shirts. Like, I saw it on sale at H&M for like $14, and I do not ever mind. What attracted you to it? I like the pattern. You know, I'm known for graphic T-shirts and I patterns, know. so I thought, you know, I want to live up to my... Oh, Garrett's look. Garrett is not having this shirt. Okay. Boys in the booth. Boys in the booth are there, and of course... Hey, guys. How you doing? John's Pretty good. John's focus group hat on from AdMark360. Uh, he's very on brand. He's yes. on brand. Garrett, what yeah. do you think about the zebra shirt? I know I saw the big pearly whites just smiling and laughing. I wouldn't choose it for myself. No? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, there is a good story that goes back to day, uh, Tim's days at Subaru, where we were at a dealer meeting in um, Las Vegas. You were, you were sidelined. my appendix out. You had your appendix out. But we had traveled earlier in the year to Italy, and in, I think we were in Florence, and Tim had picked out this shirt yeah. that you really loved. And uh, John, you should buy the shirt. It's a very puffy shirt. White puffy shirt. White puffy shirt. So I go down to this banquet thing that they were having, and one of your old... Uh, people you work with one of your coworkers comes up to me and he goes man oh no man congratulations <laughs> he goes I, I i give you full credit he goes i could never wear a shirt like that you you're carrying it off fine i can never and they all start laughing and it turns out it was like seinfeld's puffy shirt so i went upstairs and i changed did you ever keep that shirt no the, the after that the shirt did not did not survive. really yeah you know. huh i like that shirt i thought it was a nice shirt <laughs> A lot of guys wear shorts that are like that, where it'll be like an alligator print all around them and stuff. And I see a lot of it. I just not my style. So, I yeah, that. I can't do. I could do a shirt, but I'm not going to do the shorts like that. I can do. I've only had a couple things like that. I wore something. Was my our friend Kate? I'd gone down to her house and I had a. I wore a pair of shorts down there, but it was just khaki shorts. I thought they looked fine for what we were doing. And we spent the whole half of the day together. And when I left. He gave me a little hug and kiss goodbye after about four or five hours. And she says, by the way, when you get home, throw those shorts away. <laughs> by the way, when you get home, so throw those shorts away. You said nothing about it the whole time we were together. But apparently there was something up with those shorts I had on. So who knows? All right. So um, I mentioned to you that I took myself last week to the movies to see an IMAX film called Apollo 11. Right. Now, you had said something about the footage and about the Apollo program on a previous program of ours. Um, so NASA apparently found in the archives 70 millimeter prints, uh, film from the Apollo 11 launch <laughs> primarily and 70 millimeter is a large format negative. So the, the clarity of the images is amazing, but a lot of that footage has never been seen before. It was crowd shots, the Saturn V, how they rolled the thing up. So this is an hour and 34 minutes. It's just called Apollo 11. And uh, it is an amazing movie. It's super cool. And the new footage looks... Who is it narrated by somebody? Um, no, actually, it's just all the audio comes directly from the command center, from uh, newscasters. It's all stitched together. And it weaves the story from launch to moon landing to, re to return to Earth. And the movie ends with... Um, 
part of John F. Kennedy's speech about going to the moon, and then it, this credits start rolling, and then it shows the uh, there's some other scenes of the guys in the quarantine van, the whole bit, because when they came back, they had no idea if there were bacteria on the moon or something. But John, there's a scene where Neil Armstrong says to the cat, like he's they're they're approaching Earth and they're having a conversation with ground control and all the manufacturers, and you, none of us ever saw this because this footage was not available. But they showed all the people at Boeing, all, all the different like assembled around speakers and TV, like the old TVs, right. and and basically he said the the three of us went. But it's the result of thousands of people and man hours and it just, and they show all these people getting emotional. I thought, okay, it's real. And then they end with this, uh, this clip. So I'm going to have Garrett play. This is, this is the not often heard part of we're going to send a man to the moon in, in the next decade. <laughs> so this is, this is a, how the movie ends. But I want to say something after this. But if I were to say, my fellow citizens, that we shall send to the moon 240,000 miles away, from the control station in Houston, a giant rocket, more than 300 feet tall, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses, several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food and survival on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body and then return it safely to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that on the temperature of the sun, almost as hot as it is here today, <laughs> and do all this, and do all this and do it right, and do it first before this dictator's out, then we must be bold. Okay, so he was at Rice University when he gave that speech, and the movie ends, and a couple people like just are staring at the screen, and uh, this old woman next to me with her husband, they were a couple. She said, "I, I she goes, I, I would, I would stand behind that promise." She said, as opposed to, "We're going to bring coal back." <laughs> I think, and that's that's my whole point for this little little banter thing is. Steel mills are opening. Lots of opening. We're, we're gonna bring steel we're gonna bring coal back. We're gonna build a wall. There's Kennedy talking before it even happened about this incredibly complex thing to do. This one thing of putting two people on the moon and bringing them back safely. This will just we're not gonna do it because it's easy. We're gonna do it because it's, it's hard. hard. And right. and you know and the movie shows all these people like you know the, the hundreds of thousands that used to come to watch the the space launches. Johnny Carson would be there, and they're all in those '60s sunglasses. The whole bit. And I just sat there and I just thought, how did did we reach the zenith in the '60s? I guess from a maybe not, but well, it was the you know the very much about the '60s. I think so much of it, and of course there was turmoil, there was strife, there were racial issues. I mean, it wasn't all all no, you know, it was that, not all flowers and, nuts. and yeah. But um, but it, I, I think people put country before nonsense. I won't even say before party, but before nonsense, because we talked about that when we did a deep discount hidden figures yep. uh, selection of. The whole country was wrapped around the space science program, and space right, yeah. of the promise, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we had, and that's what a lot of people missed about the Cold War. Quite, quite frankly, we knew there was good and there was evil, right? There was it's a quite wall. obvious. <laughs> and you're either on the you're the west. The west is good. You know, you're either west bad. German or an east German. You're going to yeah. drive a BMW or a Treblant. I mean, it was, you know, you had you had toilet it. paper. You didn't. You didn't right. <laughs> It's you terrible. Had a, you had a job or you were in the food line. Right. You get an egg and a ham. So it, um, yeah, it's. So I, I wonder, you know, now, mind you, during the, the Kennedy years and during the NASA stuff, and, and of course he was assassinated long before he ever saw his dream of this happening, there were people that were against the manned spaceflight program. We could send robots. It's cheaper. It's more effective. This is not good science. But there it wasn't about science. This was about being putting someone on the moon and that person being an American. Yep. You know? <laughs> so. Yeah, no, very much so. And there's something that, you know, there's uh, Dave Mc David McCullough is coming out with a new book called The Pioneers, which happens to be about the Northwest uh, Territories that we got from England. 
And he taught, but I, I saw a lecture with him just recently, and he talked about the fact of the importance of Ohio in the space program. Oh, yeah. And the importance of, he said, you know, the first two people to take flight, being the Wright brothers from Ohio, and then two of the astronauts, um, um, John Glenn, went to Muskingum College, which is only 60 miles away from my school, from which Marietta. is Story Musgrave, who did the space shuttle. So he said these astronauts, these flight, this kind of promised pioneer sort of thing that we as a country used to rally around. And yeah. he said and a big part of that he took um, as our kind of our western, as the 13 colonies went west and the kind of people that it took to do that. And that it took to go to the moon. You know, so it's, what did Reagan say? Our best days are ahead of us. Maybe they Yeah, are. no, no. I, I, I miss the, the oratory capabilities of, of lifting some, lifting people up to a vision that, we might not all share perfectly, but I certainly, I certainly like it more than like that little lady. Like, Let's bring coal back. <laughs> Co- coal's back. <laughs> People are crossing drugs, opioids. We need a wall. <laughs> what caught your eye this week? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. Okay, this is a quickie. It should come as no surprise, based on the fact that when you're trapped on one of these things things happen, but the headline that caught my eye this week was, cruise workers say they have so much sex on ships that it's comparable to a college dorm. (laughs) Really? Yeah, I know. I never had any expectation of that. Sex among cruise ship workers is pervasive. Uh, Some compared the hookup culture as being similar to or even exceeding the college dorm experience. It wouldn't be hard in my case to exceed my experience. I was not necessarily hooking up in college. But the permissive sexual... No, I wasn't. But this permissive sexual culture on cruise ships can also lead to aggressive or inappropriate behavior. And romantic relationships among employees develop and end much faster. So the article talks a lot about the fact that they're... You're 10 feet away from people all the time. You dine together. This is all back of house. So, you know, you don't, as a passenger, you, you don't, don't see, see all it, yeah. this, but they live in very cramped quarters. They eat in a very specific area. And uh, so I it's, guess they have, a, I would expect they might have a fraternization nothing, nothing nothing policy. Yeah. Nothing, was, nothing was stated in the article about a a policy like that because in some ways it makes sense that you couldn't actually enforce that you know people are going to start dating whatever but one uh one person said that there's ship time and there's land time and so it appears that if you're in a relationship on a ship uh it's the for the length of your contract if you're lucky but that could be the equivalent of being seven years on dry land <laughs> in terms of all the stuff that happens right well, did you ever did you watch that show below deck yes yeah I think they have some romances. Uh-huh. Out, they sure they? do, yeah. But it's usually when they're in port, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Sometimes. but they're also in close quarters, and, you know, it's not like... So they hire these really fit young guys, yeah. and the girls are good-looking, and so... You uh missed out. <laughs> I should have... You probably could have been a purser or something. <laughs> hot so here's one guy that said, Chad Stone, a former production manager for Seaborne Cruise Line, said the dating scene on cruise ships was part of the reason he stopped working on them. Hmm. At one point, he got engaged to a coworker, but ended the engagement a month later after he learned his fiance had cheated on him during a break between contracts, <laughs> which sometimes is only two weeks or something. So, you know, I... Of course she cheated. Yeah, of course she did. That's true. So there you go. It's, it's, I, I wasn't surprised by this. Um, there were a few things that did make me laugh about the length of time uh, a relationship on the sea happens versus on the land, but there you go. Well, you know, they always show them in those tight quarters. I wonder about that on on submarines or in the military, too, right? Because companionship. Yeah, fellowship. Fellowship, that's the word we're looking for. Yeah, (laughs) fellowship. So mine, um, I saw the headline. I had to read it, and, of course, um, it was a little bit of a clickbait maybe, but (laughs) the headline was, the chicken is local, but was it happy? GPS now tells the life story of your poultry. I don't know so if I want that. This was a story that NPR ran. And essentially was a GPS tracker strapped to the leg of a chicken means the people who potentially will buy that chicken to eat will know every step that the chicken has taken, says food historian Robin Metcalf. Shoppers are willing to pay a premium for ingredients that are cage-free, organic, or wild-caught. They'd like to know if this chicken spent its life eating, happily pecking at the corn and blackberries that were locally grown and pesticide-free. So they've decided to put trackers on them, and they're doing this in China right now. There's a Chinese company, Zong Ang, Zon An, 
Chinese insurance company has already outfitted more than 100,000 chickens with trackers. And the sensors upload information such as how much exercise the chicken got and what they ate. And then they're going to spread this technology to 2,500 farms in China by next year. They're also going to work with facial recognition technology. So if consumers happen to buy one of these dead chickens, that uh, organic chickens, they can make sure that it was actually the one that they had from face recognition of their little <laughs> app. I, I'm... Which to me is odd because I, I don't, can't remember the last time I got a chicken with a head on it. <laughs> a and B, I don't mean to be... I don't mean to be non-PC, but sorry, chickens, but you all look the same to me. Well, Facial recognition for a chicken? So they want to know that if you want, if you so, and so they move forward. They talk about all this little nonsense a little bit, but they said essentially. <laughs> move forward. That, that consumers are interested in knowing where their food comes from and that the tracking devices they've used recently at a company called Driscoll's out of California which is the largest berry distributor and producer. And what they do is they have a little code on the, on the Driscoll berries, which they have them down in my store. I'm going to try it and get the app. And you can, cl you can put your phone on the app, and it will pull up where the farm came from, where the berries were from, and the family that picked them okay. or whatever okay. is there. So they said that other than kind of the absurdity of doing this chicken thing, they said they really want to do it for the industrial sector. And they talked about the E. coli tainted lettuce and they said if they could actually track food better with GPS ordinance, if something happens to the food supply, you don't have to get rid of the whole food supply. You could just say, you know what, it happened at this particular location or it was this particular crop. And so you wouldn't have to all of a sudden just uh, you know, all right, dispose all right, of millions right. and millions of pounds of food. That makes sense. That makes sense. So if you bought romaine lettuce yeah. from Mexico it certain... and it was painted in Arizona, yeah. you don't need to throw all the stuff all out that, from yeah. Mexico. So... They said Walmart's also testing the technology on leafy vegetables such as spinach and lettuce. And um, they said they, they don't necessarily think places in the U.S. that raise meat are going to want to do this because they said, A, it's intellectual property, but B, it's not a the, – the, our food system about the way animals go through is probably not the most – Photogenic, or you know, oh, they, oh, my little chicken. Oh no, 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 pecking, no, pecking yeah. and eating, and then yeah. all of a sudden it gets a head slit and thrown on a box, and yeah. feathers come off, right? So, there was a uh, a trainer at my gym for a while, uh, a guy named Rob from the, I think it was from Nebraska, or the, he was from the West or the Midwest, and as part of a organization, was it the 4-H? I forget what it was. It was an organization that exposed that that exposed kids to farming and to uh, animal husbandry right. as a career choice. And they went to some meat, a, a cattle facility outside of Chicago or something, and he described something called degloving. Have you heard about this? No. It's where there's a machine that takes the entire skin off a cow, like in one pass. And he mm. said... Half the kids <laughs> dropped to the floor practically and passed out. But he just said, he goes, you do not want to know where your your food comes from. And a lot of people have said that. I know people that have watched some of those movies. I think there's a number of them on, on Netflix of mm -hmm. about your food supply. And they said if you actually saw how a lot food of Food Inc. Food, is like yeah, one of them. Yeah. That you would be a vegetarian. Yeah. It is when I think of it. Somebody said to me once, I asked, I asked her and him. It was a couple why they were vegetarians. And th this really did make me think, and they said, uh, we don't want to eat anything that was traumatized at death because it brings bad into the body. That was their view. In other words, if an animal suffered and the way an animal was killed, uh, the inhumane part of it, you're now consuming that. And like you're an getting energy, all the bad energy. Thing. And I thought of it, I, th you know. I don't know, you know, I don't know about that, but I will say that when we were closer to our own food supply, so think, we, we were not of this, we were many generations removed, but, you know, back in the day, people used to have the family chickens, so they laid the eggs, yeah. they collected the eggs, and now and then, when a chicken got all, all was ready, that, but everyone was taught how to prepare the chicken and how to cut its head off humanely and quickly. I think that's more of like I, uh, the energy thing I'm not so sure about, but I think having a respect for where this comes from and understanding how you would have to do it on, on your own is a really big thing. Because none of us, I can't, I'm not going to go kill a cow. No. <laughs> I couldn't so. kill a chicken. I mean, I would have a tough time killing a chicken. And I, I so I, you know, I've thought about, Richard's thought a lot about being vegetarian. He, he never ate meat a lot. His dad was a butcher. But he never ate meat a lot as a kid. And um, even to this day, he eats very little meat. Hmm. But I don't know. 
Well, and then you could go to what is is uh there's vegetarianism and then there's veganism and one of the one of them is nothing with eyes, right? Yeah. You so, can't even have cheese or eggs or anything. So that would be dairy. fish is out too. Yeah. I don't know. It's uh yeah. Can boys be vegetarians? No way. <laughs> Definitely not. Sorry. <laughs> I love a burger. I, I swapped my best friend of like being a vegetarian for 20 years. What? <laughs> yeah. What do you mean you swapped? I got him this to flip or whatever and start eating meat. And really? the first thing was like a Slim Jim or something. Ooh, oh, my God. Did he, did he all of a sudden his stomach go crazy? He like, was thinking about it for a while. And then I had Slim Jims. And he was like, fuck it. And just went into it. So then, yeah. And you no, know, his stomach was fine. Now he loves meat and eats meat all the time. Carnivore that he now. does. Wow. Yeah, see, I and then there's this whole thing about the fact that we, as a species... Are hunted, hunted and killed. We didn't have meat all the time. A lot of, a lot, lot of berries and and leaves in between. But it's been part of our diet. So, all right. <laughs> Business birthday. Everyone does celebrity birthday <laughs> greetings, <laughs> but the know, Focus Group is here. the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. Born March thirteenth, nineteen oh eight. Died in oh two at ninety four. Walter Hubert Annenberg, American businessman, investor, philanthropist, and diplomat. He owned and operated Triangle Publications, which included the ownership of the Philadelphia Inquirer, TV Guide, the Daily Racing Forum, and Seventeen Magazine. Richard Nixon appointed him ambassador to the United Kingdom, which he was there from 69 to 74, became very close with the royal family, and, uh, and uh, gave lots of money to, uh, to British cultural uh, institutions. He also paid for the renovation of the Winfield House, which is the American ambassador's residence in the UK. He, um, so TV Guide, we all grew up with TV Guide. You had to have it, it was must have, right? Yeah, there you was. Think about it now, you don't need it. No, but not really, no, but that little thing, if that didn't arrive you, and with the grids, you didn't know what was going on. What do you think he made a week on TV Guide? Profit. Profit. Each week on TV Guide. So that goes back to like the 60s and the 70s. I'm going to say profit was like, I don't know, 300 million. So he made 600000 to a million dollars a week. A week. Okay, sorry, I got that all. But still, that's a lot of... That's a lot of coin. A lot of money. 350 million times, you know, 52 weeks times how many years? Wow. So later on, he became a very prominent philanthropist. He gave over $2 billion to uh, educational uh, establishments and art galleries, including the Annenberg School of Communication at uh, University of Pennsylvania, and the School of Communication and Journalism at USC, and uh, big, big philanthropist, and gave a lot of his money away before it was even Vogue. And uh, so I like that. But um, I like that quote you found for him. Which, would you want to read it? Be respectful to others as you grow. If we lack respect for one group, then there is a tendency for that attitude to spread. It becomes infectious, and no one becomes safe from the ravages of prejudice. And this was spoken like what, back in probably the 70s? or 60s, 60s, 60s 70s. Yeah. He was very close with Queen Elizabeth II. There you go, happy birthday, Walter. <laughs> Died in Philadelphia. Is he really? Yeah, he was from Philly. Well, you know. 94 is not a bad run, right? No, and he had all that coin. I hope he was in a, I hope his, I hope mentally he was all there. Uh, I'm sure he was. Although, I don't know, sometimes I think about like being in your 90s and having all your mental faculties, but your body's falling apart, right? <laughs> there was a horrible thing on the news I heard this morning. They were talking about how people were happier in their 70s than any point in their life. I've heard this. And they said, well, because they don't care. So, so one of the other newscasters kind of snarkily says, well, they either can't remember anything from the past or <laughs> they, they put their electronic devices down and another woman says, because they can't see them. <laughs> and they're like, ah! <laughs> you know, they... And I laughed. <laughs> I wonder why they're so happy. They can't see their phones. They can't work up. They... Well, look, you know, and for if you were to go, like Bob's mom lives out at a, a beautiful facility, like an apartment complex, actually. But um, when you meet the other residents, to them, this whole phone gadget thing, it's yeah. the New York Times. It's what's on TV. It's, it's plain old analog living. And they're much happier, in my opinion. Exactly. Hey, many of you know that a uh, friend of ours here on the Focus Group is Deep Discount. And um, we're big fans of the Deep Discount site because you can get just about anything there. And that's what we love about them. Right now, they've got a site-wide shark madness sale. Did Sharky the Shark make it today? Arr, no, the hand puppet did not. 
So you can save on thousands and thousands of items, but all you have to do, and what we'd like you to do, is go to focusgroupradio.com and click on the Deep Discount logo and start shopping away. John and I picked two things this week, and then, of course, we'll tell you about the new release. So what did you pick? All right, so I picked a Criterion oh, release. My uh, favorite studio. They, they, they did this a while ago. Um, they, they got the Blu-ray for this. And the movie's called The Last Emperor. It's by Bernardo, Bernardo Bertolucci. It won nine Academy Awards when it came out, which is kind of an unexpected thing. It basically swept almost every category it was nominated in. Quite a feat for a challenging, multi-layered epic directed by an Italian and starring an international cast. Uh, you, have you seen the film? I haven't. It's about the life of uh, Emperor Puyi, who was the last, the last emperor before uh, the revolution and the whole. Where? China. 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 Puyi. Puyi, who took the throne at age three in 1908, before witnessing decades of cultural and political upheaval within and without the walls of the Forbidden City. In fact, they filmed in the Forbidden City. Took was the throne at three. Three years old. He was younger than Kim Jong Un. <laughs> well, he had a, a regent um, that ruled in his stead until he was old enough. But basically, in real life, Puyi lived in the Forbidden City, never left. And when the Cultural Revolution happened and they finally broke into the Forbidden City, he's like, hello, you know. <laughs> so the movie is really beautiful, and the uh, it's twenty three ninety nine on sale at Deep Discount. Uh, this is the Criterion release, and it's the theatrical release that's been restored with the new um, cleaned up soundtrack as well. And I can't wait to get it again myself because I think it's a beautiful film. I love it. You love a beautiful film. I mean, that, that's the one this, thing I do remember people talking about. It was this historic, yeah, historical. It's it's a really fascinating look at that time period. What was the time period? Do you know? Well, it was the 19th, so it would be 30s, 40s when the Cultural Revolution happened. Yeah. Wow. I picked something very totally different—a cultural revolution of itself. <laughs> what did you I was, pick? I was I was flipping around on on going through some of my my papers and stuff and and books, and I came across the book we had. A guest on years and years ago, we had on Dick Cavett. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love Dick Cavett. I started, and I love talk shows. And I started thinking about talk shows, and I said, as I was going to do my deep discount pick, whatever happened to Mike Douglas? I know. Because there's reruns of Cavett, and there's reruns mm -hmm. of Carson, and all this stuff. And of course, deep discount has Mike Douglas moments and memories. So it's uh, it's for only um, fourteen dollars and seventy cents. You can get the DVD, save yourself about twenty five percent. It's uh, a nostalgic look back at the Emmy Award winning Mike Douglas show and the man behind who became America's best loved daytime talk show host to over six million viewers. This was originally released in '08. It's uh, about one hundred and fifteen minutes long, and it features a lot of the great interviews from um, some of his more more famous guests, I would say. Uh, between 1961 and 1982, people like John Lennon, Martin Luther King, Bill Cosby, um, Yoko Ono, Bob Newhart, Mel Brooks, Billy Crystal, Steve Martin, and Tiger Woods when he was a little kid. Well, he must have been like a, a really like. I remember, I remember seeing that show golfing, and I used to. I remember two things. I remembered a lot about. <laughs> The Mike Douglas show. One time he would go off to these locations sometimes. Then he went to Florida and they had a Casey and the Sunshine Band. And I was so jealous of how long Casey's hair was. He had that long hair, do a little dance. And I, I thought, that's a cool guy. And then I remember seeing Martina Navratilova and she had this necklace on that he kept looking at, looking at, looking at. And he asked her what it was and the significance. And it was, a, it was two symbols. It had an X and it had a check mark. And I remember him saying to her, what does that mean? And she said, X check. She used to be Czechoslovakian. Oh, that's funny. That's and that always funny. stuck in my mind. So years later, when I happened to work with Martina, I remember telling her that. Of course, she remembered none of it. She didn't remember she being on remember the show. That? She didn't remember. She's been on so many shows and things. She, but she was. He used to have guests on for the whole week. He used to have them as a co-host or whatever. That's right. Special that's guests. Right. So anyway, you can get that at deep discount. <laughs> and the uh, the release this week is uh, Academy Award winning film Green Book on Blu-ray takes place in 1962. Uh, Vigo Mortensen plays a club bouncer named Frank, who chauffeurs celebrated African-American classical pianist Don Shirley on his concert tour of the Deep South. And of course, the Green Book refers to the kind of like the AAA guide that African-Americans had to use to literally navigate the South on yeah. where they could buy gas, where they could safely eat or lodge, which is, now you think about it, it's insane, but it was a very necessary thing. Um, I was just talking to our uh, our friends over at Deep Discount, and Lauren loves this movie. 
she thought it was one of the one of her favorite Oscar films, actually. So Lauren says, <laughs> Lauren says, <laughs> get, get it, get it. Yeah, <laughs> I wanted to see that. All right. So to recap, Shark Madness sale, Shark Wide sale, site wide Shark Madness sale. Save on tens of thousands of items over at Deep Discount. Get there by going to FocusGroupRadio.com, clicking on the shark logo, arr, and starting your shopping. I picked uh, the Last Emperor from Criterion. That's the one you want to get because it's the theatrical release. Tim, very cleverly, and I loved Mike Douglas as a kid, and so did my grandmother. Mike Douglas moments and memories. And the release this week is Green Book on Blu-ray, Academy Award winning film. So Garrett, what do we say? Thanks, Deep Discount. We're gonna take a super quick break, and when we're back, we got some shop talk for you, so stay with us. You're listening to The Focus Group with Tim and John. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. Focus on the savvy side of 9 to 5 with the Focus Group. Try, really try. Listen, laugh, and learn with Tim and John. I never try anything. I just do it. Still one of my favorite clips, though. And movies. <laughs> Welcome back to the Focus Group. Tim Bennett here with my good friend and co-host, John T. Nash. What's the T for, Nash? Thomas. Thomas. See, we should have done the show. We've said this before. We should have used to use our middle names. Because they could be last names. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I could have been Timothy Joseph, and you could have been John Thomas. Thomas, yeah, exactly. Well, Instead of Bennett and Ash. Thomas and... And if I'm John Thomas over in the UK, that's slang for prick. Oh, it is? Yeah, yeah. I was there once, and a friend's... Really? I never heard of that. Jonathan was giving a dinner party in my honor. He goes, and I would like to raise my glass to my good American <laughs> friend, John <laughs> Thomas. And the whole table starts laughing. And I'm like, why is everybody laughing? Oh, love, that's slang for a prick. So the <laughs> That's like there was a girl I worked with, and the, the Brits we worked with called her Sugar. Sugar. <laughs> and I thought it was endearing that they called her Sugar, but they thought it was, there was a, ra a famous racehorse in uh, England called Sugar, and they thought she looked like a horse, had a horse face. I thought, oh, they're being so oh nice Oh, my her. God, you're not kidding, are yeah. you? And, and they're finally like, you know why we call her that, don't you? <laughs> I was like, oh, that's so sweet, calling her Sugar. No, it's Sugar. She looks like a horse. It's <laughs> like, oh, well, I won't let her know. Oh, yeah. Anyway, so we've got two <sighs> shop talks here. The first one, the first headline, and uh, it says, sure, millennials might be killing canned tuna, but not because they hate can openers. And so there's, there was a couple of stories that I dug into and essentially said that uh, millennials have, have, uh, have abandoned the can opener and other, other things that uh, generation... Uh, Whatever the lady yeah. and the boomers may may have had. So if you're watching on the video, I had to put the picture of John laughing at Aunt Barbara giving the the can opener to demonstrate lid remover, lid remover, which yeah. was which was great. But um, essentially, they said millennials have killed bar soap, fabric softener, and doorbells. And I was listening the other day. You know, bar soap is more environmentally friendly than the liquid soap. I like bar soap. I like bar soap too. I don't like the liquid stuff. I don't think there's enough. I don't think it's enough to get my body clean. I like a bar. And let's you be... boys use bars or do you use liquid? I bet they use liquid. I, I go back and forth. I like the Dove body bar. You're talking about soap? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But body wash isn't bad either. But I don't know. Don't what you have to you, use Derek? too much? Be honest. What's I, that? I don't use anything. <laughs> he doesn't. He says you don't need whoa, whoa, it. He says just whoa, nice whoa, whoa. hot water. He's always telling Derek, me that. You got to clean your par private parts. You rinse him with water and stuff. And you have a girlfriend? Yeah. I, I don't smell. She's, I asked her if I smell. She says no. He really doesn't. It's, it's all a scam made up by the Procter & Gamble people. And the Unilevers. They, yeah. It's interesting. I mean, I got to say, I'm with Garrett all the time. He smells great. He's not I've sweaty never, guys, look, or I've greasy never, looking. His hair always looks great. I never noticed. Uh, to me, I never even crossed my mind. I thought your, your shower. Yeah, I'm Tim with you, is, Tim. I love a nice Tim suds. is I moving like in all smell. lathered up and, and rinse it I'm off. I'm going to come I smell feel, you later afterwards. Oh, please. Please. T Tim is moving into catatonic shock. I, I'm, I, this is, is jaw-dropping it, it, to me. But all right. Like maybe if I'm, you know, play basketball or something, then I'll use soap like once or twice a okay. year kind of thing. <laughs> if I get real sweaty. Boys in the booth. But you that just booth. rinse off. That's all you... That booth. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I only realized recently that, that Bob, like, commented to me the other day. I said, we're running out of shampoo. He goes, that's okay. I don't really use it. What's he do? Just takes he the He rinses bar. his hair. Just rinses it. 
it's fine. I mean, it, it's actually fine. It's like what Garrett was saying. He it, just rinses his hair. It took like two weeks to get back to normal, but after that, because you're, you're usually just stripping all the oil every day with the shampoo. And that's actually something that's good for you. Like when you when you use soap and stuff on your skin, you're getting rid of some of the natural stuff your skin has yeah. to protect itself. I, I'm not, I, I'm a soap guy. I'm an ivory okay, soap guy. well. Sorry, I, mean, I, I don't that. shampoo all the time because <laughs> it makes your hair look nicer if you don't shampoo all the time, you know, every other day, every few days. Yeah, so, yeah. And, and hair, I, I, that one I get in a way, like just yeah. rin, rinsing, unless you're using a lot of... I use a, a bar of soap sometimes, just run it unless through. Unless you're using a lot of product up there, but... Well, anyway, they talked about tuna. <laughs> and they said, back back to our topic. But thank you, Garrett, for that. That was enlightening. <laughs> the... Um, <laughs> they say that sales of fresh and frozen tuna are on the rise, however. 32% compared with 45% of the 18 to 34-year-olds bought um, fresh and frozen tuna, but they're not buying the canned tuna. And they initially thought it was because they don't have can openers, but they said that's not necessarily the case because a lot of stuff now has got the pop bo- yep, pull yep, tops, yep. or they've even put tuna in bags now. Bag tuna. So they said it might be other issues. Well, and they uh, the article, the, the next to last paragraph said, here's an alternate theory. Maybe millennials aren't eating as much tuna because they grew up learning about how dolphins were often killed when they became trapped in tuna nets. Or maybe it's because they're health conscious generation that worries about mercury poisoning. Or maybe it's because it's a generation that cares about the environment and struggles with a level of tuna overfishing. <laughs> you know, could be. Then he says, okay, it's still the generation that made ahi poke bowls. What are, what's an ahi poke bowl? Is that so one those, those are those new, bowls you can get with um, it's all pre-made. The raw, right, the raw fish and the raw tuna or whatever. You just that, zap it or avocado something. Avocado and a little. No, you don't zap it. You eat it like that. Oh, okay. You don't like raw fish. No, I don't. No, I do not. So. That was the alternate take, is that maybe they, in fact, someone in the article said, no, based on our, our research, kitchen appliances and things like measuring cups and, and can openers, they're, they're still selling, they're still increasing in sales, so maybe it's not that. But then they said they do think that it might also be the stodgy connotation of a can. And they they pointed to sardines, that sardines have become popular again, but instead of saying they're canned, they're tinned. They're tinned. Yeah. These our, are tinned. Our sardines are Tint. Tint. So I don't know. I, th- I thought about that, but I, I don't. Uh, do you have can openers at home? Do you have an electric one or a hand yeah, we, one? we have a hand one. And I really, frankly, after Aunt Barbara's demo of the lid remover, which I still watch now and then just to make myself like let the back of my head hurt from laughing so hard, um, I feel like I should get that and that will be the last thing I have to buy in terms of. Well, I thought of that as well. Lid I, I, I was I was going to get the lid remover as well, but. But did not. The other the other story we have is uh, is about Dr. Seuss, and uh, I was not aware of this until I read this article. I think John found this article. It says Dr. Seuss books can be racist, but students keep reading them anyway. And they said that uh, in the past uh, in February, I believe it was that it was millions of students and teachers were taking part in Read Across America, which is a national uh, literacy program. It's usually celebrated around the birthday of Theodore Geisel, or better known as Dr. Seuss. That's exactly how I would pronounce it, yeah, better known as Dr. Seuss. So for over 20-some years, kids would dress up in, in, in cat-in-the-hat outfits or other, other costumes, and then they would have a week of reading. And then the article says, but some of Seuss's classics have been criticized for the way they portray people of color. In And to Think That I Saw It on Mulberry Street, for example, a character described as Chinese has two lines for eyes, carries chopsticks and a bowl of rice, and wears traditional Japanese-style shoes. I guess it's that wooden thing with the two, yeah. There's a picture up there if you're watching the video. Oh, perfect. Okay. And then it says, uh, in If I Ran the Zoo, two men said to be from Africa are shown shirtless, shoeless, and wearing grass skirts as they carry an exotic animal. Outside of his books, the author's personal legacy has come into question, too. Seuss wrote an entire minstrel show in college and performed as the main character in full blackface. Um, so NPR actually did this article, and it's pretty extensive, and they talk about the challenges, the more broad, the broader challenges of taking literature that has been kind of woven into our upbringing, school curriculum, and the culture, and now that we have... I don't know how they uh, how they put it in the article, but now that we see it in a different light, what do you do with it? Because it's still very popular, and kids still right. And, love it. and they said a lot of this is obviously coming to light, um, particularly in the last few months. They said, should we continue to teach classic books that may be problematic, 
um, and, and show books or teach books that are more have more positive representation of people of color. They gave some examples. They talked about the adventures of Huck Finn, where the N-word appears over 200 times. 200 times. times. I didn't even realize that. And, and some other, other literature. And, the that, and Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice, where the uh, Jews are portrayed as greedy and money-hungry. Um, all the and Shakespeare was known to be uh, have a keen understanding of human nature and continue to still be relevant today, even though these portrayals are in there. And so, what do you do in that case? Do you do does does do you still continue? Because they said a lot of these books, teachers will talk about the craft of writing and how they were well They'll use them as examples. As yeah. examples, but I, I do I do I don't think you can wipe away history. No. And I, I do think that there's some relevance. But they talk about how if kids grow up and immediately see themselves portrayed as other or being laughed at or not being part of mainstream society, quote unquote, that uh, it has a negative effect on them. And um, well, I think it was this teacher in Philadelphia that probably summed up my feelings about this the best. She said, not engaging with problematic texts like a Seuss or uh, the Huckleberry Finn type thing runs too great a risk of not learning or understanding where the problems lie. And the, um, she said, I, she's an English teacher in Philly. I believe there is a way to look at material that is stereotypical and racist and identify it for what it is and then hopefully in doing so neutralize its effect. And she said when her class, when her high school kids uh, read One Flew Over Cougar's Nest with her senior class, she was careful to teach students how to read the work through a critical lens that took the author's background into account. The class discussions, she made sure to emphasize that context to her students as they exam that context as they examined the work. So what was going on at that time? Right? Yeah. So what, she, was the, yeah. what was the culture or what was the society like at that time? The other thing they go back to, they then bring it back to Seuss. And this one I, I wrote a side note about. It said that, um, again, they talked about Dr. Seuss not portraying any any people of color and those that did were depicted as racist stereotypes. And I thought to myself, I never, ever thought of any Dr. Seuss character being a person. <laughs> I well, almost first, looked at it as cartoon like a Bugs Bunny thing. I never, I never viewed yeah. a Dr. Seuss character being anything but yeah. a cartoon or like. Did you think the Grinch was a person? Not at all. And this is around the time that you would be reading Curious George, who's a monkey that acted like a human being. Right. So I was a puzzle piece. So, he do this. So I, you're talking about like an illustrated children's book with rhyming language and a cat and yeah. some eggs. I my own um, reader, re, my own story. It's not suitable for for the focus group, but someday maybe we we do an offshoot somewhere. If we're on Derek and Romaine, I can talk about it. But I had my own uh, my own run-in with Read Across America while I was in college. Which oh, uh, that thank, story! Thank God, the tape doesn't exist. That story will make the hair on your neck stand up. It is so that is politically incorrect. incorrect that I, it's. I, I, yeah, it involves a hammer too at the end of the story. Involves a hammer at the end of it, and a professor and and a lecture. And a lecture. <laughs> Everything you're not supposed to do. I would I would offer up the thought that uh, you know um, things like Dr. Seuss. If I were to ask my nieces about it today, I doubt they could tell you too much about those stories. They might remember the titles like Green Eggs and Ham or, you know, The Grinch is Stole. Like they, they, but I don't know that they would remember specifics about what they took away from it in terms of the story or the characters. I'm not, I'm not rushing this under the table. I think it's an issue to talk about. But at the same time, I take that, that instructor's uh, critique as the way to go contextualize it, give it a reference frame, but still talk about it. I, I, it. It made me think about, you. Might, I don't know if you remember this episode, where the Flintstones, are, they go to the Boy Scout Jamboree. Yes. It's a world global jamboree. Yeah. And then everybody sings Old MacDonald, and they go to the different countries. So they show China, they show Germany. So China, the, the kids have on these... The, the sandpan, those like hats. Hats those rice and, the, and, the, and the smaller eyes. And then they go to Germany and the kids are on later who's in and then they're Dutch and they got wooden shoes on. I mean, it was... Every, I, every trope, right? Again, all stereotypes. But I never, again, as a kid, I always thought it was kind of cool how everybody looked different, but I never looked at it as being... You didn't take a negative out yeah. of it. You, you just thought, wow, everybody's different. Everybody's different. Yeah. Each country's got their different thing. They dress differently. They mm -hmm. look differently. They, they speak differently. I never took, that's all I took away, but I don't know. Sometimes I get, I think sometimes we get too hung up, but we're not supposed to have that feeling, John. We're white guys. <laughs> we are not allowed. We are not allowed to have that. All right. 
want to thank you for joining us today, everybody. Uh, thank you, Tim. Thank you, John. Thank you, Garrett. We want to send a big thank you to Deep Discount. Check out their site by going to ours, focusgroupradio.com. Click on the shark logo. Arr, it's a site-wide shark madness sale. I want you to look at the Criterion release of The Last Emperor. Uh, you picked Mike Douglas, Moments and Memories. Yes. And uh, the release this week is Academy Award winner Green Book, uh, starring Viggo Mortensen and... How can I? Do you guys know how to pronounce his name? It sounded right when you said it, Viggo Morgensen. No, the the actor who plays the jazz musician, Ma. Ma oh, Marsala, maybe. Marce that's it. Yeah, yeah Marsala Ali. That's it. Because like, I, I always get caught up on one of those letters. So. <laughs> so, everybody have a very good week. Don't text and drive. Arrive alive, and we will see you in the new one. All right. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group.